satisfactorily, no matter where you are, then you can participate in ways that you couldn't before. Um, knowledge workers don't need factories. We heard a lot about that this morning. Um, but knowledge factories, knowledge workers do need um, information infrastructures to connect to. Think of the sophisticated service model you would need if you were a knowledge worker based here, working for half a dozen different organisations in any given day or week, connecting to their own information via their private network, via the internet, and what you would become as a security breach potential for the fact that you might be logged on to all five companies' virtual private networks all at the same time, and your PC is the place where they all find an interconnection point. And those five, five companies might be all completely competing with each other in the marketplace because you as a knowledge worker might be supplying knowledge services into a range of your competitors or a range of your clients which would in fact be competing with each other every day. Um, so that environment of work um, starts to be a very interesting digital one as well as a physical one and has some real challenges. Uh, I, I, I think uh, what's going on in teleworking is really fascinating right now. There's a, uh, some precincts being planned for uh, enabling teleworking in some rural communities, uh, not so that you can work from home so much, it's so that you can work in clusters of people who are similarly working um, from, a, from a distant location, but together. And there's some interesting experiments starting to emerge around, well, um, if, if the place we go for meetings happens to be where there's a coffee shop and, uh, and, and a bunch of people who are somewhat related because they're using the information in their business are all starting to share workplaces and coffee shops and are they starting to interact and are starting to find partnership models and collaboration models amongst themselves that could develop new and interesting business ideas. Uh, there's, there's now interesting uh, development to help nurture that and help develop that and it could be that instead of uh, the business model of going into a cafe and wanting uh, to simply justify using the table by buying half a dozen cups of coffee you could, in fact, rent the table and, and have the coffee only that you need. I mean, I, I don't know if, if this happens to you, but if I have half a dozen quick beans with half a dozen different people in the city when I'm in the city, uh, and they all think that the mechanism is you go to the cafe, you justify sitting there by buying a cup of tea or coffee, man, after a morning of that, you can be seriously hyped. Um, it, it might be more convenient to, in fact, simply um, rent an hour's space at the coffee table and be happy that you paid for that hour and you can just stay there. Let's test that business model. And let's, te let's test that if people are working in that environment, then perhaps they're also shopping within walking distance. And does that mean that an environment forms around where you want to work rather than where you traditionally had to work? Very, very interesting emerging changes uh, happening in that space. And for individuals, there is just as many changes. Um, and those changes that I was just describing are as much an impact on businesses as they would be on consumers. But, but you know, things like more support for independent living. You know, one of the projects I'll talk about tomorrow is about assisting people living in an independent way for longer without having to move into retirement buildings with, with greater information support. Um, impl implementation around um, uh, activities, you know, like theatrical activities. I'm involved in a theatre company uh, that's based in, in Hobart, and we recently put on a production where two different theatres were connected with massive bandwidth. There, were, uh, there was the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra playing in one theatre and an Indigenous group of uh, performers playing in another theatre and they were sharing effectively a virtual stage. The play going on on the two stages was in fact one play, but the two audiences saw completely different perspectives of that play. And I really mean completely different perspectives. And it turned, it, the story was about two teenage boys who were having um, parallel dreams and one of them was an Indigenous boy and one of them was a, a a white boy, and they, their dreams were, were linking with Dreamtime stories. Very, very fascinating story, but the, the actors were spread over the two stages uh, quite some distance apart. You know, in one, uh, Bernie and, and Hobart were the two towns, so you know, quite a long way apart. And the audience was seeing a perspective of a multi-dimensional story. Very, very interesting model. Very interesting to think about what that does for, for entertainment and cultural development as well for the individuals, wherever they are. There's also, and we've, I've referred to this already, really significant impact in, in economies. Um, there is, uh, you can read the numbers there, but um, you know, the, the industrial revolution we've lived through already took, took 50 years. The internet one's taken a lot less than half that. Uh, and there's already two billion connected things, but we're gonna see hundreds of billions of connected things. And uh, 
all you've got to do if you've got kids is add up how many devices end up in your home sometimes and how many of them are flooding your Wi-Fi infrastructure at home to realise just what can happen. And that is just devices that we are able to see. If you look under the guts of your car, you, if you look hard, you'll find somewhere between 50 and 100 computers. That's just for one car. Your home can probably justify between 100 and 500 buried in it. Uh, and, and you won't know what they are. You won't know what they're doing. All you'll know is that your environment works a bit better than it did before. Cars now work at different altitudes just as effectively as they do at sea level. Cars now work in different temperature ranges just as effectively. Wipers come on automatically because the computer tells them to, and all of these other things that have been taken away from the driver as responsibilities. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of those functions, and we don't give a rat's ass about them, to be honest. We don't look for the Intel inside thing on the side of the car. We simply like to buy a car based on the, the, the characteristics we perceive, and that sort of thing is what's going to impact in our homes just as effectively with the Internet of Things and devices connected without us even knowing. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I might uh, just get to this point of um, SMEs. They are the biggest beneficiaries of ubiquitous broadband. They can do things far more effectively than big companies can, and in fact, they always have and always will. So they can leverage ICT in ways that big companies can't. But interestingly, when they do, the more they spend, the more they, they benefit. And there are some really interesting studies now that show that spending as much as 30% of a budget on, on web presence for an SME might create a, a growth trajectory that's sort of eight or nine or 10 times what, a, what an organization spends if, if they only spend 10%. So you know that sort of change is a pretty dramatic impact. And the role of government is really significant here too. Um, there's a big role to push usage within government and be a catalyst for change within government. That sounds like an oxymoron, I get that. It's a really interesting challenge to think about how government itself can change. And if we reflect back on that chart I put up right at the start, uh, showing the internet as a separate, nicely corralled off industry um, and how much I disagree with that. And then what happens when all those other industries start to, to break them down at the, the barriers and we start to see overlaps and the really interesting digital economy stuff starts to go in those overlaps, starts to go in the gaps between traditional government departments. Um, but supporting, supporting industries and business through, uh, through government is pretty fundamental. And, and just two examples, there are um, models in South Korea and Sweden which have, have set up programs to really um, help develop the understanding of digital economy issues for businesses. Um, in, in that SME space with fewer than 10 employees. Uh, in fact, um, you can look no further than, um, than Armadale as a really, really uh, successful program of small business training for, uh, for local uh, entrepreneurs and small business players. Uh, the, the local chamber of commerce runs a whole range of, of really good SME uh, training modules for bringing up the level of digital understanding and literacy within the small business community. And it's having a measurable effect already. Um, so that, that's, I think, pretty fundamental. Okay. We might just jump over one or two of these things, but I think I really need to stop. Yep. So to summarise, it, it's, it's actually not too hard to measure the, the digital pulse of a community. Uh, and these are just, I think, what you would call the, the top five ways to measure the state of play in a community. And, and it starts very basic, you know. Is, is there broad, broadband and what is the penetration rate? You know, that's, that's a very easy thing to, to, to measure. Um, you can start to look at what sort of um, knowledge workforce in, in exists within the community through their educational levels, through the, the, the student to PC or computing ratios, um, the availability of higher education. You can, you can, you can measure the, the, the state of knowledge workforce. You can measure the state of innovation in, in many ways through uh, understanding uh, the local um, business incubation environment. Are there, are there entrepreneurial activities happening within a community? Are there local web developers that are getting things online in, in a truly uh, significant business way rather than just a pretty website to say what your, your business does? You know, is it transactional? Is it developing? advertising strategies, is it, is it, is it moving towards a marketing 
uh, dimension. Um, I don't know whether any, any of you have played this, this game, but if you're, if you're a Facebook user and, and, and happen to, uh, as I did recently, um, say to my wife via Facebook, uh, we, we should be thinking about a holiday, and her reply was, yeah, I, I really wish we could plan something soon. And I said, where do you want to go? She said, the name of one island, and within 10 minutes was being bombarded by advertising on Facebook for that island and, and, and other neighbouring places. Um, that is push marketing uh, in a social media context, uh, highly optimised, and it is highly optimised already. So there are plenty of tools like that that are mature and available, and, and you can actually measure what's going on in a community based on their, their degree of engagement with those sorts of social media tools. And this whole area of digital inclusion, understanding um, just the availability within public spaces of, of, of connectivity, the, the ability to, to train the, the, the elderly to get more involved, the ability to engage more with the socially um, a restricted community. You know, there's, there's lots of different elements to this. And they're, they're, once again, they're not that hard to measure. Um, and, and that whole marketing and advocacy domain as well. So if you can get that measure, then it's actually not that hard to think about what things ought to happen next within a community. Um, so, and this is uh, my final slide, I promise. Uh, so to really summarise, if you can measure in a community what the state of play is, and you can think about, therefore, what might be the next logical steps for that community, there are some really interesting um, opportunities, which I hope I've tried to, to illustrate right across the board. Um, it's about the innovation that happens through the ubiquity of all of this, not just getting faster movie downloads. Uh, and I think that the way to, to summarise that whole thing is the traditions of every old business is about a business model that made sense to everybody that was one of them. One of the most important characteristics that's really changing now is how many business models we have to choose from as consumers and as business players. You know, carving out an interesting new business model where nobody else had been before can have a profound impact on the industry. And I can think of no better example than what happened, it must have been a decade ago now, when one small panel beater in, on the outskirts of Sydney decided that it would be a competitive advantage if you could take digital photographs of damage to vehicles and email them to the insurance assessor so that the assessor could give him an over the phone or email reply to, yes, you can start working on that car, I'm satisfied that your quote is valid and, and no damage is what you say it is. That, that one person from one SME, within 18 months, had an entire industry operating that way, had the insurance companies demanding that that was the model and the premiums were adjusted accordingly because the process was, was affected. Um, so you can think about the big insurance companies involved in that. You can think about uh, the, the, the number of SMEs across the marketplace. Uh, that they are very big end of town and very small end of town, but that one guy had one good idea which gave him a competitive advantage for less than a year. And uh, it, the industry changed because of it. Now, some of the other dimensions on, the, on this chart um, are ones that we haven't really explored a whole lot, but it, it's now actually possible to think about a future world where the old telephone network is completely gone. We don't use telephone numbers anymore because it's so much easier now with smart devices to use IP addresses to get to people. And in fact, all you really do as a consumer is use a name rather than a number. And the number is becoming a, a more and more pointless translation to a network behaviour. 